www.co.com.au or give us a call today on 03 9023 9370. Fast, proactive, personal. That's DKP and Co. Chartered Accountants. Ever wanted a career in football? From TV deals to player transfers, football is now a global multi-billion dollar industry in need of qualified professionals who know the sport inside and out. Brought to you by the Global Institute of Sport, the Masters of Football Business is delivered by experts from Australia and around the world. Learn online with unique access to networking and guest speaker events at the iconic MCG. Be one of the first Australians to get a football master's degree. Apply now to start in February 2022. Learn more at gis.sport slash fnr. gis.sport slash fnr. Sometimes I feel... I don't know. I don't know. Buona giornata. Buona serata. Buona giornata. There's not really time to relax and take an espresso for Juventus. <laughs> You don't have to get a bad bitch. You don't have to get a bad bitch. Attaccare! Yes, indeed, Atacare, and welcome back to the Euro Show after a week off. We're back, Nick Tabano here and Josh Parrish here to go through all the action in Europe over the weekend. It's been action-packed throughout all the big leagues, plenty happening. We'll even dive into the AFCON final this morning, which saw Senegal uh, be, be crowned champions, defeating Egypt on penalties. And they've got a bit of a quirk coming up in a few weeks' time, so it's not the last we'll see of that matchup in a high-stakes scenario. But, Josh, welcome. It's good to be back. A lot's been happening in the world of football. Absolutely. Uh, We've got Aussies scoring abroad. We've got high-profile transfers coming through in a big way. And we've got a Serie A title race blown wide open by one man. Absolutely. One of the most beautiful footballers in the world to add to that, Mr. Olivier Giroud. What a stunning, stunning game. But we'll get to the Milan derby and Serie A in just a second, Josh. Let's start with a bit of Aussies abroad because it's been a big Big weekend for the Aussies. I mean, Aidan Rustic started it all off the other morning, um, well, on Sunday morning, came off the bench for Eintracht Frankfurt, led them to a 3-2 win over Stuttgart, scoring a double. I don't know if you've seen his second goal, but my God, what a volley from outside the area. Derek Ray loved it. And it's great to see after we all said it, he should have started against Oman last week in that, you know, drab two-all quali- draw against Oman. He just says, look, you know what, Arnie, this is what you're missing out on. And he comes out and he scores a double. It must be really cool as a younger footballer to be suddenly playing in Germany and have Derek Ray actually commentating your goals because it must feel like you were scoring with yourself on FIFA. Yes, <laughs> I, you watch I genuinely back. think so. When you're watching the highlights, you're probably like, oh, my goodness, this is, this is surreal. This is not just happening in a video game. It's actually happening in real life. Yeah, he came off the bench and scored twice. They were both off set pieces, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, sort of top of the box and especially that that volley uh, into the ground fantastic technique on the side volley and that's obviously one off the training ground because there's no way that they would have crossed to him in that position unless they'd practiced it and it seems as if these teams in germany have really taken ralph raniuk's message to heart in that 33 percent of goals in football come from set pieces so let's let's spend a third of our training time on them and uh aden hrustic with the fantastic technique he has with his left foot is the beneficiary of that so great goals well oliver glasner their manager has benched hrustic as well so arnie's not the only one that hasn't been giving hrustic the starts as of late we know that hrustic started the season like a house on fire in the Bundesliga, but then once they brought in a few other players, he found himself on the bench. Mm. They haven't been able to wa- been able to find a way to start him and Jakic together. We know our good friend Ante Jukic has been clamouring for it on Twitter to finally free the both of them and have them playing together. We saw a sample size of it in, the, in that uh, 3-2 win over the weekend once Rustic came on in the second half and how the game changed. Maybe this is the performance that could springboard him back into the starting 11 going forward. Well, it's tough because Jakic because has been outstanding since he signed. Uh, Sebastian Roda is the one with the name recognition because he's come from Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund. Uh, and obviously he'd be on, on bigger wages than, mm-hmm. than Hurstic, you would imagine. And then Dribble Sau is, is a Swiss international. He starts for the Swiss national team most of the time. So competition for places in that three-man midfield uh, is pretty intense. And because they play 3-5-2... 
There's no other place in the team for Hrustic. He can't slot in on a wing because they're playing wing mm. backs and there's no way Hrustic is going to play as a wing back, right? So, you know, the only other position for him would usually be cutting in off the right in a front three and they play a front two and, and wing back. So it's just those three positions in midfield that he's contesting and that's probably the strongest area of the park for Eintracht Frankfurt. So it, it's a tough, tough ask, but with a performance like that, you'd have to think he's, he's in the mix for a start next game. Absolutely, and it's it's quite exciting to see at least that, you know, we've got our Aussies overseas playing well, but obviously mm. not even just playing, playing in a big five league and doing that as well. Um, the other one this morning, though, we've got to touch on is a guy that we all were marvelling over during the international break, and we have for quite some time, is Tom Rogic. A double against Motherwell this morning. Um, some talk, you know, in, in the aftermath about the fact he's out of contract at the end of 2023. It's not the first time that Tom Rogic has been linked with a move away from Celtic uh, throughout his tenure in Glasgow but another win for Celtic backing up that old firm with a big win on the road uh, an expected win for them and they're flying now towards what looks to be a title winning season I mean Rangers did win 5-0 against Hearts we know that Hearts obviously have a few Aussies of their own Nathaniel Atkinson and Cam Devlin but Celtic at the moment are just flying on a different level right now yeah and uh, the starting lineup. Uh, it was all guns blazing from Ange Postacogli. He did rotate a couple of players. Juranovic came out, uh, the right fullback, who was so good against Rangers in the Old Firm derby. And Tom Rogic came back in for Matt O'Reilly, who, you know, there's big competition for places there now. He was signed unheralded player from MK Dons, I believe mm-hmm. it was, yep. for two and a half million. Uh, excellent set piece taker, good technique. Uh, he was dropped after his fantastic old firm performance and, and Tom Rogic came back in and justified his selection in emphatic fashion with two bangers, one in particular from outside the box that just pierced into the top corner and then a great finish from a cutback. Uh, Celtic doesn't seem to matter who plays uh, mm. or in what position. It all just seems to be clicking for them at the moment after a tough start to, to life. Uh, Ange Postacoglu has, has really worked out what makes this team tick and they've adapted to his methods more importantly. And 3-0 against Rangers, 4-0 against Motherwell. Um, they're top of the table now uh, by a point and they deserve it. Yeah, well, I'd love to hear your thoughts listening at home on the Twitch, wherever, Facebook Live, and let us know your thoughts on Tom Rogic, on Celtic. Um, put a question out to you, Josh, but also to those listening at home. With Rogic coming out of contract at the end of next season, where can you see him ending up? Can you mm. see him extending at Celtic? I mean, he's almost been there now for a decade. It's amazing to think that he's literally been there his entire football and career since leaving the Mariners and having a short six-month spell at Melbourne Victory where he, you know, was riddled by injuries before the 2014 World Cup. But do you see him staying? Do you see him now at 29 making the leap as everyone's always thought, will he go to a bigger club? Or can you see him now... I mean, making that unheralded move to the golf where all those rumours were swirling a few years ago about him, you know, almost making the move to set yourself up for life or can you see him sticking around and building something special with Ange at Celtic? Because there's a chance Celtic are going to be playing Champions League next season and I'm sure Tom Rogic would love to be part of that. Yeah, look, I, I don't think he will go to a big club from here, to be honest. Uh, I think that window is probably closed for Tom Rogic, given his injury history and given how inconsistent he's been able to participate inconsistently, uh, then I don't think he's attracted the interest of a bigger club. And I think, you know, the uh, stock that you build up in one club and your reputation and how much is forgiven uh, for your, uh, I guess, lack of fitness, uh, unable to see out 90 minutes a lot of the time, lots of muscle injuries... Celtic have been very patient with him because they know how good a player he is, because of the performances he's given them in big games, cup finals, et cetera, and so on. You know, they've given him enough rope. And with Ange coming in, who also is familiar with Rogic, you know, that leniency has continued. They've been able to rotate him and uh, not push him too far, uh, but also, you know, give him a key role uh, when they need him, especially to break down some of these Scottish teams who are going to put a lot of players (laughs) behind the ball. He's a very handy player to have. Uh, to go to a bigger club, I think the scrutiny would be higher. I don't necessarily think they would be as patient with Tom Rogic and that might end up in him being frozen out of the first team and, you know, all sorts of dramas could ensue. So I think the best move for him would be to stay at Celtic and stay playing under a manager who understands his qualities and his physical limitations. The other move, as he said, to the goal to cash in, couldn't blame him, Mm. but... We see what it's done for Aaron Moy's career. He's yeah. taken a bit of a dip since he went to China. 
not entirely under his control, of course, yeah. uh, because of the COVID stuff that's wreaked havoc with that particular league and financial difficulties the club has run into at Shanghai Port. But uh, I would advise against that move just yet because we still need Tom Rogic playing at the highest level possible. And for me, that is at Celtic because I just don't see a club in a top European league making a move on him at this stage in his career. Well, let's be realistic. I mean, he's going to be part of the soccer's next World Cup phase. At least, you know, if, if we don't get to Qatar, he'll be there. You'd think part of that team that's going to push towards, you know, the uh, the USA, Canada, Mexico. I'm trying to think of what the, the acronym is for that just yet. Uh, you know, Yucame or something, you know, I'm off the car with something, the, the CONCACAF World Cup yeah. um, in 2026. You think he's going to be playing a big part of it. So you'd think... By the stage that comes around, he'd be about 33, 34. You'd want to still be playing in a top league because the rise of guys like Aden Rustic, et cetera, it's going to put a bit of pressure. And we all know what it's like once a player makes that move elsewhere, it can potentially work against you, you know, in terms of playing. We all know how good Tom Rogic is, but if he moves somewhere else, you know, I, I have my concerns, as you did say, if he goes to another club, whether it is in the Premier League, whether they will be as patient, whether, you know, it has... Everything has passed him. I mean, naturally talented, he certainly has it. I mean, he can play in Serie A, he can play in Bundesliga, he could play in the Premier League. But I think you can bank on another two years of him of good football with him at Celtic. So I think that, you know, well, by that time that extension comes, sign through to maybe 2025, and then from there reassess. Because at that point, we don't know how cooked his body's going to be. I mean, the, the guy has had the worst mm. luck with injuries throughout his career, you know, going back to when he was, you know, 18, 19 at the Mariners all the way through to now. So let's hope his body can stay intact for a bit longer. I'm, I'm feeling like we're starting to see... I I think this is the best of Tom Rogic that we've seen. Mm, maybe since 2017 around, around the Confed period? Cup. Yeah, around that period at least. I mean, at that point for club and nation, he was on, in just impeccable form. But since then, we've seen a, a real dip and now he's starting to reach that level again. So I think Ange is the right guy to potentially get the best out of him. Um, Josh, let's move on. Mm-hmm. Um, it is still sticking with the Aussies abroad kind of theme before we move into the, the real big news coming out of Italy. But Davis Drillic, a new assistant coach at Genoa on the weekend, um, obviously <laughs> with Andrei Shevchenko being saved, Drillich is new, part of the new coaching staff there. Um, good to see another Aussie in the coaching setup overseas, um, joining, obviously, as we mentioned, Ange Postacoglu, Michael Valkanis. Um, I mean, is John Van Skip potentially like a, you know, like a Russell Crowe situation? He's ours because he was here for so long. But he's another one to, to join the ranks and it's good to see him in a big five league. Yeah, I mean, he's had a lot of experience as an assistant coach now. So I'm excited to see him get his first head coaching job eventually. And the fact that he was sort of handpicked by RB Leipzig to coach some of their youth teams, uh, having that MLS experience as well would have been really interesting. Uh, and now at a big club like Genoa shows that his skills set is valued highly. So I don't know whether he'll be a head coach. I imagine that's the goal for him. It's not the goal for everybody, of course. Uh, some people prefer to remain in the back room, but uh, certainly uh, great to have an Australian in Serie A, even if we don't have one on the pitch. Yes. Well, um, uh, the new coach is Alexander Blessing, who is the former coach of Ustende in Belgium mm. um, and was an assist, was a youth team coach at RB Leipzig. So that's where the connection is. Yep. Um, obviously bringing along, you know, trust his trusted confidence and uh, Zdrilic is one of those. Uh, we know Genoa's situation when it comes to coaches, they are very trigger happy. Um, and, you know, hopefully it doesn't mean that if, you know, the, I hate saying the inevitable because it feels like it always is an inevitable there that the coach ends up getting sacked, that he's not lost on it and hopefully he can stick around and maybe impress and take, have, you know, get some attention elsewhere. Maybe he's another assistant or potentially he's a senior coach somewhere. Um, but also just before we completely, as we mentioned, all the other Italian stuff happening, uh, Frank Karasic has coached Pippo Inzaghi. He's been sacked by Brescia. So what that means for Frank Karasic will be interesting to keep an eye on going forward. We know Karasic had his problems with long COVID. He's only just recently started to get back into the starting lineup um, for Brescia and Serie B. Um, that's a real watch this space to see who takes over Brescia and what that means for Karasic going forward. Because I was impressed by Karasic during the last international break against Vietnam, against Oman. It looked like he was labouring a little bit later in the game, which, I mean, when he's playing two 
you know, quite high octane games in quick succession for a guy who's barely played football, a guy that's coming off long COVID. You can expect that. So I hope that whoever comes in at Brescia will make sure that, you know, Karasic is a big part of it and he can continue his development there. Yeah, of course. Uh, it was uh, notable his absence and Australia suffered for it. Uh, as you say, did flag late against Oman, as many players did, and ended up giving away the penalty. So it wasn't a good night for Fran Karasic, but Brescia third in the league in Serie B, pushing for promotion, just two mm. points off the top. Uh, you think it's a bit <laughs> harsh, uh, yeah. the decision that's been made there. So uh, hopefully he stays in the first team. It doesn't seem to have been their defending that's been a problem recently. Uh, they've only conceded 21 goals in 21 games, which mm -hmm. isn't too bad at all. Uh, so, you know, you wouldn't think there'd be a huge shake-up in that department, especially when he's a current international player. Um, but as I say, I don't watch Serie B, so I can't no. comment specifically. And neither but, do yeah. I, Josh. So as much as I'm a Serie A enough, I don't watch Serie B. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so uh, it is surprising to see Inzaghi go. Um, you know, it's another coach that they're... Tri another true happy Italian boss, who would have thought? Uh, Massimo Cellino has moved on. So despite them being third, it looks like Inzaghi is out the door. Anyways, let's move on to the big news coming out of Italy. Um, Milan derby on the weekend. It was the game that was going to either end the title race or resurrect it. And it did the latter. I mean, an, a crazy final 20 minutes of that game. Uh, Inter looked like they were cruising. 1-0 up after Ivan Perisic put him ahead. Simone Inzaghi, the brother of Pippo, decided... He was not going to push for a second. He was going to sit back, make a lot of defensive changes, brought on the likes of Di Marco and Damian and look to try and, you know, clog things up and sit back, which is very unlike Inter. You know, mm. they say, don't always change. You know, if it's working, why change it? You know, yeah, and if it ain't it's broke. It, you know? Yeah, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, and Milan, we know them, their, their attitude under Stefano Pioli is, has been just... It's a sensational attitude. Never say die. They're always pushing. They're never out of a game. And they prove that. They hadn't created a hell of a lot before those 10 minutes. Olivier Giroud barely touched the ball. But with two of his touches, as uh, Manuel, the co-commentator, said on being Sports on the weekend after his second goal, he's had four touches, but two of them have landed in goals. I don't know if that was an accurate assessment. I think you have more than four touches. But two amazing... Well, I mean, the first goal, right positioning. But the second goal... The touch to wrong foot De Vrij and create enough space for him to whip around on his left foot and curl the ball past Sandanovic was vintage Olivier Giroud, to say the least. And as a result, Milan are now back in the title race, a point behind Inter. Napoli winning on the weekend gets them back within a point of Inter. Obviously, Inter have that game in hand, but boy, it's going to make for a fun few months in Serie A. You mentioned Inter being the negative ones in this match. They're not the team that started Franck Kessie as, as a, a pressing number 10 to try and stop Marcelo Brozovic playing. <laughs> yes. yes, and it seemed like this has been the case a few times with Stefano Pioli. For a, for a coach that likes to play on the front foot, sometimes he comes out with very conservative tactics in big games. And the Kessie one didn't surprise me one little bit. Uh, for a bit of context, obviously, Marcelo Brozovic is arguably the best defensive midfielder in the world, but I don't think he required a man-marking job in that game. Um, Kessie played as a 10 prior to AFCON against Empoli and scored a double. Obviously, against Empoli, he's going to be afforded a lot more space, a lot more opportunities inside the box. And Kessie's a pretty good finisher. That's one thing that's a real underrated trait of his. But Brahim Diaz being out of form, I saw the reasoning why, but it failed miserably in that kind of game because when Milan were breaking on the counter-attack, when you had Kessie and Olivier Giroud through the centre... It was very slow. There was no movement bar Rafael Leal on the left-hand side. And then they made the change. They brought Brahim Diaz on. And just like that, Milan were looking more lethal going forward and the game completely changed. So Kessier came off in what minute was it, roughly? It was around 75th? the hour mark. It was oh, before, around the hour yeah, mark. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the game did shift at that point. But up until the 75th minute, up until the Giroud goal, which is basically a huge chunk of mm. Milan's XG for that match, they were on 0 0.4 expected goals. Yeah. So they were playing it pretty cagey up until that mm. point, even though they were a goal down before the first, you know, first half yeah. ended. So 
I think it was Inter here who shot themselves in the foot, really. Yeah. Especially the equalising goal. I mean, the winner, you can say whatever, but the equalising goal, the way that Alexis Sanchez gave the ball away there and the positioning of his teammates, just totally suicidal. Like, football's a team game and there's a reason you have midfield lines, defensive <laughs> lines and attacking lines. They had not three lines but two yeah. in, that, in that phase of play. And even, you know, they, they had four players running blindly ahead of the ball and when Sanchez wasn't even facing forwards, no mm. one offering laterally for him. Yeah. And then just a line of defenders and not even a straight line, a staggered, staggered zigzag line yeah. that had no hope of even playing an offside trap. Yeah. And there was about 30 to 40 metres in between those two neat lines of uh, squiggly lines of players. And, you know, you just got to watch it, but it just looks shambolic the way the ball is turned over there and the situation that in to find themselves even even the chasing back of the forward players looks very lethargic and half-hearted yeah. and the defenders don't organize no one steps up it's an absolute disaster so inter shot themselves in the foot in this game they could have read, written mm. this out and instead they coughed it up late and they only have themselves to blame well once they gave milan a sniff once that equalizer happened there was no turning back really and it just seemed like the energy in the sunset or changed um the milan fans um, to the right of screen where Milan scored both goals really started to rent the noise started to lift and you felt that the players really fed off that um, you know Giroud we talk about the him bustling Alexis Sanchez out of the way that looked like straight out of the training ground at Arsenal back in the day two former teammates Giroud with the a hip and shoulder won the ball back and to be honest it looked like Milan were going to fluff that play up because Diaz had Junior Messias to his right he ignored it scuffed his shot and Giroud was in the right place at the right time to turn the ball home. Um, but to give Milan credit, I mean, this in the past, I've probably said this that many times during this Pioli period. These are the games Milan used to lose just constantly in the period between them making the Champions League in 2014 and the period before last season. They would cough these games up. Um, they go behind, you know, the heads would drop. They'd never find a way back. Under Pioli, you can just tell the attitude, even in games that they've lost, they are always in the game. They are always pushing. They are always, you know, fighting. They're a confidence team. Once one goes in, you just think, when are the next one or two coming? And, you know, i got to say, before Giroud scored those goals, despite the fact Milan didn't have Zlatan, didn't have Rebic, I thought he was going to get benched. I, I, he barely involved himself in the game whatsoever, which I still think, despite him scoring both goals, he's not Milan's answer up top as much as he has that quality to score those two goals. Um, it was just, you know, right place, right time. And you've got to give credit, you know, to the players behind it because the likes of Diaz coming on and having that big half now is so big for his confidence, you know, coming off long COVID after the start of the season he had. And it was really disappointing to see his drop off. But re that game... He looks reinvigorated. Looks like that international break kind of did him well. You know, them not playing, mm -hmm. having that week off. Him coming off the bench maybe might actually be the answer. Coming up against tighter legs. Um, as what much is it as about? Sorry to interrupt, but what is it about Olivier Giroud that no big club is willing to stick with him as their first choice number nine? Everyone's always looking elsewhere for a slight upgrade, but he always delivers. You know, I he mean, said it was right place, right time. But Olivier Giroud has made a career out of being in the right yeah, place at the right time. It's an interesting one because and I his just, per ninety goal numbers are sensational. They are sensational, but the way Milan want to play it doesn't suit Milan. Want to press, yeah, and okay. if Milan want to press, you can't have a guy like Olivier Giroud lead that press. You want Ante Rebic lead that press. Mm. And I know that Pioli has lived and died by Zlatan Ibrahimovic. I'm going to say the corpse of Zlatan Ibrahimovic because <laughs> despite the fact he's their top scorer, he's you can tell now like the, the, the knees are clicking, you know. It's, like it's the, a bit weekend at Zlatan's. Yeah, it's, it, he's struggling a little bit. Like he's got the quality to play 20 minutes, half an hour and really, you know, and pop up at the right time, but you don't want to be banking him in every week. But you know, I've got to give Giroud credit. You know, he found himself in that right area. The way he took that goal was masterful. Um, I I honestly just couldn't... The, the You can't teach that, you know, as a number nine. That is just something you don't see often. The, well, the, the ability to create your own space as a striker when you make those sort of touches. Because most strikers in that... In, when they receive the ball like that, would probably hold the ball up. Or, let's you know, let's describe the goal for the people well, who haven't seen you know, it. So you see the ball come through. going to pull it up right here. So you see Calabria here, plays it through. Giroud's made the run into the box. He's got De Vrij behind him. Play it, Josh. Takes his touch. 
Now, in that situation, he could have touched it with his left facing away and could have held it up, waited for whether it was Messias. I think that's Teo Hernandez there. Yeah, he's got, or, a, he's got a player alongside him in the box. He's sort of level yeah. with the penalty spot to the right-hand side of the goal, almost yeah. level with... Uh, if you were to draw a line from the left-hand side of the six-yard box to the penalty spot of the goalkeeper's left, then yeah. he would be on the corner there. What he see, and in that situation, he had three into defenders, and then he had four... You know, he saw the four defenders trailing on the edge of the area, no one else presenting. The smarts to not hold the ball up and, you know, potentially lay it off, but take it on yourself by wrong-footing De Vrij, like just Ronaldo mm. chopping the ball away from him so he goes the other way and then whip it around Handanovic. I mean, it's a Cruyff it's, turn. It's, it's not a Ronaldo chop, but, you uh, know. I'll... Cruyff turn, okay. Sorry, that just shows my millennial in me. <laughs> that is... A brilliant finish. And even if that was safe, the way that he still created that space is insane. Um, Because he he knows what he's about to do before he gets the ball. Yes, absolutely. He's leading leading the defender away from goal and then chopping the ball on the turn, on the Cruyff turn, on the inside of him. So what you're seeing is, if for those watching at home, what you're seeing is there is De Vrij is obviously running away from the ball and in any other situation, in most situations, your number one instinct is a strike. Even just receiving the ball... In any phase, we've all been there as players. You always think to touch the ball with where it's coming and stand still there. And You're keep, waiting for keep someone. the ball away yeah, from the Yeah, we've defender. been taught, you know, keep the ball away, look for an option, not take that on. That is, if you mess that up and you lose possession and you don't play the ball, that is a coach killer. Like, the coach <laughs> will be in your ear. Tearing your hair out. But not many players have the ability to do that. You don't see that often, and only the best number nines can do that. And despite, as I mentioned, Giroud is not the long-term answer, he's probably not the answer for this season when Milan are at full strength, that you can't teach, and only a few strikers in this world can do that. And we've seen Giroud do that throughout his entire career. He scored an identical goal for Arsenal against Liverpool at Anfield years ago. Just like that. And, you know, he's done some ridiculous stuff in his time. And I know, Josh, you're about to pull up another moment. Yes. Yeah, which so reminds you of as this, well. This instantly gave me flashbacks. It's a mirror image. It's a reverse. Giroud chopped it with his left foot and then turned and, and swung with his left. It's the right foot of debutante for Manchester United in 2009. Aston Villa 2, Manchester United 2. Federico Marqueda comes yeah. off the bench. And he loses the ball, gigs from outside the box, spots him. He's in a very similar position, a little bit Cruyff further turn. out than Giroud. Wrong foots the defender yeah, with the Cruyff turn. First time. Spins, <laughs> and an even better finish. So I'm just saying that's not a Cruyff turn, it's not a Ronaldo shot. No, it's that, a is, Ma- that is a Makeda. That's a Makeda <laughs> manoeuvre. And that's the that's brilliant. And we can say that that's Federico Makeda's signature move because he never did anything else in a top level match. Is so. Makeda one of the is he is he the greatest one hit wonder? I mean, to be honest, he hasn't actually faded into total obscurity. Obviously, he hasn't done anything in Serie A no. or the Premier League since you know he since he had that burst and since he scored a couple of goals for Manchester United in that title run, uh, but. For Panathinaikos in Greece, he's a regular goal scorer and has made over 100 appearances. Wow. So, you know, he's found a home in Greece in the last four years and, and well done to him. I mean, you know, it, it's not everyone's destiny to be a so top long Premier until, League striker. So and... how long until Western United sign him? <laughs> <laughs> I would actually love that. You know what? For the, for the value, and I think as well, just this is a, a shout-out to Makeda's management, if you're listening, if potentially listening, <laughs> I would love, like, he would have a fantastic story. I think his story just from playing under Sir Alex and how, you know, he's been able to still forge a career despite being labelled as a flop has been unbelievable. And I'd love to hear all of that. Because imagine, like, I was so young back then. I think I was maybe 11 years old. But I even remember the hype. Mm. People say, this guy is going to be the future of Manchester United, the future of Italy. There was so much hype around this guy. He never then went on to play for Italy. Maybe played a handful of games for Manchester United. But there's a good story there with Federico Makeda. And, you know, if his agent is watching, we're honoured because it's Mino Raiola. Yeah, well, Mino, (laughs) if you're listening, hey, we would love to have him on F&R. So... um, (laughs) Yeah, the yeah. feel is we're out there. The that, is there. We're naming that manoeuvre the Marcada. It's done with, yeah. but Giroud, well done on emulating yeah. one of the greats. Anyways, uh, moving on to another big game in Serie A this morning. Uh, Juve's new big two debut, Dusan Vlaovic and Denis Zakaria. They both scored on debut. It gave me memories of when Milan wheeled out Christoph Piotek and Lucas Paketar and they dominated on debut. But 
if you could actually see the goal through the t- intense fog in Turin, Dusan Vlahovic took his goal brilliantly, um, playing up front in a diamond with Paulo Dybala and Alvaro Morata, which actually looked really damn good. Mm. Dare I say it, I think Allegri has found a way to fit all three in the team. I was a skeptic in thinking, you know, one has to go, but it worked. And, I mean, 4-3-1-2 is Allegri's, you know, that's the formation he mm. used at Milan. You know, when he burst onto the scene, he used it at Juve in his first stint. I think he's onto something here. He's gotten the defence right over the past couple of weeks, which wasn't looking great, especially centrally. Um, you know, he's got Matty Delete backed. He's got him forging a good partnership with Chiellini. In midfield, they are looking better without looking spectacular. I mean, Aaron Ramsey's gone, which... It pains me that he never got to the level which I was hoping for at Juventus. But Zachariah is a good signing. And he scored a nice goal as well, bursting off the right mm. side of midfield. And maybe that midfield three of Artur and Rabiot, I can't believe Rabiot is still in the Juventus starting lineup, might actually work for him. They're into fourth now. And it's looking very likely that they're set to push ahead. And I don't think they're going to get into the title race. But hey, this this could be a fun end to the season for Juve. Well, they've got a good mix of attributes in there. I'm not a fan of, of Adrian Rabio either, but the one thing yeah. he is, he is an above-average dribbler yeah. in tight spaces. Uh, I think he's pretty selfish. I don't think he works that hard. I think no. his passing range and his awareness of players around him is a bit limited, but a bit like your sort of Kovacic-style players. Yeah. You play them on the left, left-hand left side of a diamond and you just get them to basically dribble and advance the ball that way and you've got... Players offering for the ball on the inside, like uh, Dybala and mm. Artur, and an overlapping fullback on the other side. Maybe that's enough structure for them to, to thrive and have enough obvious passing options to get, have that direction and not have to make mm. too many decisions themselves, I guess. Um, I I like that blend of the sort of deep-lying playmaker who likes to receive and dictate the tempo in Artur, the dribbler, and then the energy glue guy mm. in, in Zachariah who's yeah. just a box-to-box machine yeah. from the Bundesliga. Uh, and they love those sorts of players in the <laughs> Bundesliga and they're coming at a premium to other leagues now. Uh, and as you say, the front three, a good blend of creativity, the movement of Murata and just the raw power and finishing ability of Lavic. But even having said that, his finish taking the ball on the run. It was a sloppy goal in fairness. It was yeah, a, but a he pretty, did well. pretty messy, uh, well, it was a terrible pitch and foggy day. Yeah, um, But great second ball win from uh, Dybala and first time ball over the top yeah. and he takes that chip at full stretch on the run no second thoughts about it just he's a natural finisher and that's what he brings to this side and I think that might cover for the flaws in Morata's game and that he's so good at creating chances but he's also so, so good at creating at finishing them yeah but he you know, he's always, he always, always flushing, fluffing his lines in front of goal, Morata and having someone along, alongside him who's a true poacher who's a true finisher in Vlaovic I mean, Juve are looking pretty scary well, now. What you're going to have is, as you said, you're going to have Vlaovic as sort of the focal point, you know, the big enforcer, the big body up there, Morata being sort of, you know, creating that space. He's such a smart and intelligent player to play alongside him and there were moments in that game where you could see it, just the synergy already within weeks, within days, how they've been able to sort of mesh already and Dybala who just has to feast on the carcass as, you know, the... Second ball machine, creative whiz, just going to buzz around the feet of them two and going to give them service all day. It looks like it's going to be a really exciting front three. But also, this works because Juve losing Chiesa for the rest of the season and having flaws out wide, it masks that. They don't have to start Bernadeschi anymore. They don't have to push, you know, Alexandro or Decidio playing as, you know, wingbacks or Danilo in that sense or play Rabio out wide, which we saw it didn't work, or Weston McKenney for, you know, for God's sake. They could actually now go with those three and then just work out, all right, now we just need to find the best mix in midfield. I think that those three might be the way forward. I thought Artur was really underutilised in that first period of time. I thought, especially this season. He was I think completely was frozen out yeah. for months, and now suddenly he's done something to redeem himself. Yeah, but with Benton Court now gone, the, it, it opens up for him. Mm. So I think that this is a good opportunity for him because it looked like he was gone. Yeah, it was, it's been an incra- crazy turnaround for Artur. I mean, remember when he was signed, he was basically swapped for Miralem Pjanic. And it was essentially yeah, interesting deal. a strange financial manoeuvre in order to balance the FFP books for both clubs mm. because you 
uh, take an incoming transfer fee and you apply it straight to your accounts. But what clubs do with uh, player signings is because they view players as assets and not one-off purchases, they actually divide the player's transfer fee year by year over the course of the contract they've signed. So if you sign for someone for 100 million euros and you sign them for a five-year contract, you can actually say 20 million, 20 million, 20 million like in installments, in yeah. installments over the five years on your books in terms of financial fair play. So even though you're actually, you know, paying that money up front, which is mm. a bizarre thing creative work, accounting yeah. measure and you know it doesn't really reflect well on the game the fact that Artur and Milim- Miralem Pjanic basically swap clubs for a comparable fee you know there was only about 10 or 20 million difference between the two mm. two players and they're very similar players really yeah um only for you know the purposes of creative accounting but you know having said that he's now playing a key role and it's taken some time but he's he's made his mark on the first team and I, I think Juve as you say he was only Verona. It was only yeah. Hellas Verona. Let's not get hey, too they've carried been, they've away. Been all right this season. They they've may have found right. a balance. Yeah. The one thing I will say about the diamond is: does it work in Europe? Because Serie A teams yep. play a lot narrower than a lot of other teams yep. in Europe, particularly the Spanish sides, the English sides, tend to play with out and out wingers more mm. and overlapping fullbacks. And if you're playing a diamond, you can get overloaded in wide areas. Whereas in Serie A, you play these narrow formations against teams you that are all playing you know, yeah. four three one two or three five two. You've only got basically two two players out wide mm. in each team, so that that's one kind of mismatch I think that maybe has pointed to Allegri's yeah. lack of success in in Europe and haven't been able Absolutely. to get over the hump. This this happened, you know. I remember back in the day when he was, you know, first at Milan, those first two seasons when they got outplayed by Tottenham. You know, literally it was that same thing. The goal came from those areas, and against Barcelona, they struggled in those areas as well. Um, those games against Villarreal are going to be an intriguing watch. I mean, Villarreal haven't, you know, set the house on fire this season, but we know what Unai Emery is like, and he's going to have something planned for that game. So that's going to be an intriguing watch in itself. Um, just before we go to a break, in terms of some of the other big results, because we'll get to AFCON in just a sec, um, Atalanta dropping points on the weekend, 2-1 loss against Cagliari last night. Um, Napoli 2-0 win against Venezia. Victor Osimhen back on the score sheet. Yes. Great to see. He's wearing the Batman mask at the moment to, to um, help his facial injury. So it's great to see him back out there. If other leagues around the around you've been keeping your eye on in League One, PSG 5, Lille 1. They're steamrolling to, li- to the League One title. No surprises there. Dortmund 2, Leverkusen 5. So Dortmund now are nine points behind Bayern Munich. And we said it two weeks ago. It was a matter of when, not if, Bayern would eventually kick away in that one too. So it's looking like Serie A is the only title race that is still alive right now. Because we know City are basically home in the Premier mm. League as well. Yeah, it's certainly wide open between a few teams there. You mentioned Napoli. That game, uh, just for people who like football minutia, uh, had a goal in the 100th minute. It, we got to triple digits. So we you know did. something weird's happened when that happens and uh, I think it was the red card in the 95th minute that ended up yeah. elongating uh, <laughs> that stoppage yeah. time. But Andrea Patania scoring the rare 100th minute, minute goal. goal. <laughs> yeah, and um, for those obviously as well, if you want to have a look at you know interesting red cards, just go and have a look at Teo Hernandez's red card in the <laughs> derby. The most professional red card you'll ever see in the last 20 seconds, just chopping Denzel Dumfries who've been going at each other all day, just getting all his frustration out. And then at the final whistle, if you want to have a look at this on Twitter, go and suss the, the sideline fracker between some of the Milan and Inter officials when Teo Hernandez was coming off and the Milan fans were celebrating. There was a guy in a wheelchair that was trying to get involved as well. <laughs> so you see this whole fracker involved and this guy just comes wheeling in you're like, Jesus, like everyone's getting involved. Like it was unbelievable. And, you know, you see Pioli, he's right on the field to celebrate with his team. Then you see him detour and like 180 and go, oh, my God, Taro's in trouble. There's like five Inter guys that are about to, you know, potentially hit him. So he's coming in there, dragging each other out. It was the guy in the wheelchair, the guy that Teo Hernandez just tackled or? Uh, no. Because no, that was not. a vicious foul. Yeah. Professional is one word for it. Cynical is maybe another. <laughs> yeah. Brutal a third. And, um... Also, if you like a bit of pettiness, go and suss Arturo Vidal's Instagram story. He posted uh, the Serie A title, uh, sort of the standings at the moment, and just said, Buona notte. So no more meetings between Milan and Inter in the league. They might meet in the cup, but not in the league. We can only hope. I 
want to see... I think they're on the same side of the draw, so I want to see another meeting in the semis because they'll play two legs, mm. and that will be fun. So keep the, an eye the, on that. The Milan quadrilogy. I can't wait. I cannot wait for that as well. <laughs> Let's take a break, Josh. Other side of this, AFCON and La Liga. Don't go anywhere. Since 1998, Lanco Group has been providing superior civil engineering solutions and advice to developers, local government and service authorities across Australia. Lanco Group is known for delivering sustainable, efficient solutions. By working closely with clients, Lanco Group is able to meet the complex infrastructure requirements for residential, commercial and industrial developments on time, on budget. Find out more at lancogroup.com.au. Lanco Group, your business partner for engineering solutions. Launch your global career in football business. Study a master's degree online with unique access to the MCG and a big hitting Australian industry network. Brought to you by the Global Institute of Sport, who also have campuses at the iconic Wembley Stadium in London and Etihad Stadium in Manchester. Be one of the first Australians to get a football master's degree and join GIS's global network of football leaders. Apply now to start in February 2022. Learn more at gis.sport slash FNR. That's gis.sport slash FNR. Are you looking to change your destiny in life? Be your own boss? Start your own business? If you are, you need people who understand your needs and are committed to helping you make it happen. At DKP & Co Chartered Accountants, we are more than just accountants. We are business advisors, taxation consultants and strategists that specialise in setting up businesses. We understand the client and give them the very best customised advice and strategies to achieve their goals. Visit our website dkpco.com.au or give us a call today on 03 9023 9370. Fast, proactive, personal. That's DKP and Co Chartered Accountants. Ever wanted a career in football? From TV deals to player transfers, football is now a global, multi-billion dollar industry in need of qualified professionals who know the sport inside and out. Brought to you by the Global Institute of Sport, the Masters of Football Business is delivered by experts from Australia and around the world. Learn online with unique access to networking and guest speaker events at the iconic MCG. Be one of the first Australians to get a football master's degree. Apply now to start in February 2022. Learn more at gis.sport slash FNR. gis.sport slash FNR. Sometimes I feel... I don't know. I don't know. Buona giornata. Buona serata. Buona giornata. There's not really time to relax and take an espresso for Juventus. <laughs> Welcome to the Euro Show here on FNR Football Nation Radio. If you're listening on the podcast, make sure you subscribe to the FNR Spotify. Apple Podcasts, wherever you get them. And give us a review too. If you're yeah. a regular listener and you like our content, chuck us a five-star review. Yep. Why Anyth- don't you? And drop us any questions as well. Make sure as well that, you, you know, if you want to hear us talk about a certain topic next week as well, drop it in. Yeah, we, we love sure people we getting yeah. in touch. So drop it in the comments, tweet at us. Um, my Twitter is at Josh Parish underscore. Yours is the same. At Nick, Nick Devano underscore. Because there is another Nick Devano out there. I actually got it. Did I tell you I got the message from I the thought it was Matt Hummels. No, 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 no. And it wasn't Jamie McLaren <laughs> either. Um, but no, no. I actually, funny story. A few weeks back, I was just sitting at home and I get this message from Nick Devano. And I'm like, hold on a second. Like, how is this possible? Like, is there another? And it turns out there is someone and he lives in Canada and he said, you know, I've seen your name whenever I've had to like Google it for a resume and I just thought I'd message you and say hi and just let you know that I'm a, I think he said he's a teacher and he has like kids and everything. It was really wholesome. Yeah, shout out to so, other Nick Dubano. Yeah, and if there's another Josh Parrish out there, make sure oh, you get I, I think there's stuff. about 17 of them, but I anyway. I think you need to make a group chat with all of them and just like, you know, the congregation, like all the homers, you know, and they all meet well, there the front. Was, there was a, a viral Facebook event uh, not too long ago where all the, uh, I think all the Joshes in the world met up and had a pool noodle battle or something <laughs> to see who could finally be crowned, crowned like King the, Josh. King Josh, the 
one one person who could keep the name because yeah. there's too many. Uh, but uh, let's talk about AFCON because Senegal have been crowned champions. It was nil-nil after 120 minutes. Uh, the game went to penalties and Mohamed Salah didn't get to take one. No. So he was the Number fifth five. taker. And, you know, Jamie Carragher has come out on Twitter and condemned, you know, this bonkers decision that keeps cropping up every couple of years where, you know, your star player is supposed to take the pressure kick, the fifth one, and doesn't even get to take one because uh, the earlier players uh, fail in their in their spot kicks. So uh, Mohamed Salah was helpless and uh, watched as Sadio Mane, his Liverpool teammate, went from villain to hero, having had his penalty saved in the 90 minutes by uh, Abu Gabal, the uh, Egyptian goalkeeper, he stepped up, smashed it into the corner and Senegal are African champions. And they will meet again in a matter of weeks in a crunch two-legged World Cup qualifier and we've spoken about the absurdity of the African World Cup qualifiers draw mm. where literally all the favourites are basically playing each other. It's it's like, does the African Confederation want like the best of Africa playing in the World Cup or is it just to maybe give... You know, it's like the FFA Cup, you know, a bit of a rig draw. Who knows? We're not trying to spark conspiracy theories here. But anyways, in terms of the game itself, look, you know what? For 120 minutes, no goals. Sadio Mane could have had them up inside the first 10, as you mentioned, from the spot. Um, but you, look, you know what? Senegal have been the best team all tournament. It's been a weird tournament. I mean, a lot of the favourites, we're talking about that, they were bungled out, bundled out very early. Mm. Um, but look, you know what? This, it was it did throw up the big question, which has seems to, seems to always come up after a big penalty shootout is why was that person not taking the penalty? Why was that person on that number in the pecking order? Mm. I'm of the belief if you're the best penalty taker, you take it early and you bank the point because at the end of the day, you've got to put pressure on the opposition. I understand the reasoning for maybe leaving to number five because you need to have probably your most clutch player in that moment to either keep the game alive or win it for you. So for me personally, though, if I was a coach and I was putting out, you know, five, if I was picking five players, I'd be saying, you know, best five, one to five, you know, your best, your second your best. best first. Yeah, best first. Or even not first, but I think they have to be in the top three because if it gets to that point where you're down like 3-1 mm. and... You know, you, you're, you're having to work your way back into the shootout. You don't want your best penalty taker then. You want to be on the front foot and be pushing at that point. What's the hardest penalty to take? Number one. Number one. I disagree. Well, I reckon one, like the first, first penalty. I think the hardest penalty to take is when you're already behind in the shootout, someone before you has missed and you know that if you miss, it's probably curtains. You reckon? Yes, because I think there's been studies done on when players most often score in missed penalties and players who have, have the opportunity to win the shootout with their penalty almost always score. And players who have to score to stay in the shootout more often than not, well, miss. If you ask Jorginho and Bukai, uh, yeah, Bukai Saka, they both missed. Yeah. <laughs> they had one to win it, saved. One to keep in it, saved. So Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, yeah, there are always way, yeah. exceptions, of course, of course but yeah, I would sure. say for a balance mm. to have, you know, more pressure potentially riding on the penalty versus actually getting to take one, I would say your best taker should go third. So sort of just... Balance Smack it bang out. in the middle. So it's almost like a like a triangle. Like yeah. you have your best and you work your way backwards almost. So it's, or maybe not like a full, you don't want to have like your worst at the start, but maybe like I a bit of a I a would stag- say your best three takers, but your best taker goes third. Yeah. And then maybe the fifth penalty isn't necessarily the best penalty taker, uh, but somebody who can handle the nerves. This is more of a character thing as opposed yeah. to you know, technical penalty-taking ability. So well, so. we all know that obviously in the world of football, you know, strikers aren't always the best penalty takers or attackers. Mm. Usually you see centre-backs and full-backs getting their opportunity and usually they're much better penalty takers or as we in T- TNC law have, you know, keep hearkening back to the peak moment of ICC history. Maybe it's your goalkeeper like Joe Hart did in that famous MCG friendly who will flush it into the top bins. So... I mean, it it's is an different to do it in a friendly match, yeah, though. But hey, it was a bloody good penalty. Was, yeah, look, <laughs> yeah. I mean, just ask Jared Tyson; it can go wrong. Yes, we do know that very well. Hey, just talk about Jared Tyson. He was actually there on Saturday night. Just an interesting oh. little tidbit. I thought he was off in the Gold Coast. But um, in terms of the game itself, in terms of the penalties, I think it, it 
it, it is such a tough one because every coach has a different philosophy. And it is hard because if a player puts their hand up and says, I actually want to be fifth, does that change the discussion? Because mm. if you, if say like Salah turned around and said, I actually don't want to take the first one to four penalties because I just don't feel comfortable doing it. I don't feel like I can score in that moment. Is that when you kind of bend and you go, all right, like, cool, we put you at number five? I, I honestly think the fifth penalty for a player in their head is more pressure because they're thinking, oh, the game will be on the line. True. So I don't know if you get that situation necessarily. I, guess so. I think this should be sorted in Just advance, by the way. Throwing out some hypotheticals out You know, there. I mean, maybe there are... Uh, exceptions for injuries or mm. you know players just not feeling it in the moment but I think you should have your your order sorted beforehand but honestly penalty shootouts we always focus on the takers and the players who've missed I think it more often than not comes down to the better goalkeeper absolutely and that's why my money was always always on Senegal in this match Eduard Mendy because Eduard Mendy was between the sticks and obviously um, Abu Gabal is no slouch either he saved one in regulation obviously uh, but Mendy has proven himself to be one of the best goalkeepers in the world over mm. the last 18 yeah. months to two years. So I'm not surprised that he's come up big. Um, AFCON often comes down to a penalty shootout as well. So they yeah. should have been prepared for this. I think it's something like half of the last 10, 20 finals or 10 yeah. finals or something have gone to nil nil and gone to penalties. It's like there's some ridiculous stuff. I, I don't have it offhand, but I remember there was one, I think about ten years ago, where Zambia, I think, beat was well, so Ivory Coastal Ghana in the final and it was on a penalty shootout. It was some crazy, crazy penalty shootout. And I just remember because it was such a big moment, because obviously Zambia, you know, they they are such a small nation. We haven't heard of Zambia since then, but the fact they won it in a penalty shootout, I mean, who knows? It's it's an Unbelievable! You, I believe you got the stat up in front yeah, of you. Yeah, well, this isn't so much a stat as a, as a personal uh, one from Jonathan Wilson, who often yeah. covers the tournament for The Guardian, and says, unless there's a goal in the next 15 minutes, which seems utterly implausible, uh, and there wasn't, he was right, he was treating this during extra time, yeah. half of the 10 Cup of Nations finals I've been to will have been nil-nil and penalties. Wow. Uh, to which Sid Lowe replied, an entire continent would like you to stop going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he's missed a couple, but he's been to most of them, and... They, yeah, this this yeah. match, there's always so much on the line. But AFCON is also all, all about upsets, and we yeah. saw plenty of upsets in this tournament. Uh, so I think it's it's been a good one. Yeah. I would just say the, the best story to come out of this final for me uh, was Aliou Cisse, the Senegal mm. coach, who missed a penalty in an African Nations Cup final uh, that they lost and has now won one as redemption. a coach on penalties. So that's, yeah. that's redemption. That's the redemption that yeah. da- Gareth Southgate didn't get. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a, no, so yes, uh, in terms of obviously underdog stories, what I was hearkening back to is this. When you look at this game, if you are curious and you want to have a look at old AFCON finals, this was also a nil-nil as well between Zambia and the Ivory Coast. You look at this Ivory Coast team that came out in that game. This was peak golden generation Ivory mm. Coast. You know, the likes of Colo Toure, Sol Bamba, Sakatine, uh, Zakora, Yaya Toure, Cheek Teote, Javinho, Salomon Kalu, Didier Drogba, Max Grader, Wilfred Boney, Didier Yakonen lost on penalties against Herve Renard's Zambia. Mm. And they it went to 8-7. So they could it didn't even have to worry if you were the fifth penalty <laughs> penalty taker. Both goalkeepers probably would have been thinking, oh my God, I've got to step up. And the Zambia goalkeeper was actually number five. Kennedy Mawini stepped up and scored the fifth penalty. So it goes to show, hey, you just got to have the medal for these big moments, and he did. So maybe fair, maybe you're onto something there. Fair play to him. Yeah. I mean, if you, it, it must be confusing to celebrate after scoring a penalty and then remember, oh, I have to go back in goals for the next yes. one. But uh, AFCON is always so good to watch. I think the highlight for me uh, was when an outfield player had to go between the sticks yeah. because of the COVID, COVID case situation. Yeah. <laughs> A uh, highlight, but also a low light. Well, there's a great steal show, yeah. of that goalkeeper, makeshift goalkeeper with his hands behind his back in a one-on-one <laughs> and then realising and having to <laughs> go up and, and try and save it, you know, yeah. force of habit. Or what VAR has done to these players, I Absolutely. suppose. But, uh, yeah, great, great yeah. tournament. I think deserved winners in the end, uh, but it's hard to say that amidst all the ups and downs and, and upsets. But, uh, yeah, great tournament, great drama. And for Mohamed Salah, you got a feel for him. But then again... You know, he had a couple of chances to win it in the 120 minutes. and Didn't uh, take it. Yeah, he, they were saved, so...
So just looking ahead, for those who are keeping an eye on those African qualifiers in late March, it's going to get very testy in late March in international football. I'll tell you what, Josh, I am not looking forward to it as an Italy and Australia fan. I'm very, very nervous for those mm. few days. The fact Australia plays Japan and Italy plays Macedonia the next morning could be a very tough 12 hours. But those five qualifiers, Egypt versus Senegal, Cameroon versus Algeria, Ghana versus Nigeria, uh, DR Congo takes on Morocco and Mali takes on Tunisia. So some of those heavy Heavyweight nations are going to miss out. Um, opening up the door for someone maybe like Mali or DR Congo to make their way into the tournament. There's some of the names we haven't seen. We haven't seen Morocco in the World Cup in quite some time as well. So there's some interesting storylines to keep it on. Some new faces potentially at the World Cup, but maybe the African champions might. Maybe the Af- sorry the African runner up runners up might actually have the last laugh after all because maybe it might be mm. like hey. We lost the final, but you don't get to go to the World Cup. It's chance for revenge for sure. What if it comes down to penalties again after the oh, second no. leg? <laughs> oh, no. I Played wonder, in Dakar in Senegal. I wonder if Mo, Mo Salah will still be fifth in the taker list. Oh, uh, you'd have to think. He'd have to go early. You'd have to think so. You'd have to think he comes up the rankings just a touch, just a little bit. I wonder. But Anyways. Uh, to steer us back towards Europe, the uh, ostensible ostensible uh, remit of this particular show. There is one big game in La Liga we should talk about, yep. and that's Barcelona 4, Atletico Madrid 2. And the thing that stood out to me was actually in the pre-match of mm. this game where uh, the manager of Atletico Madrid... Diego Simeone. Diego Simeone. Yeah, Cholo. Yes, Mr. Cholo, brought up a comment that Xavi had made about Atletico six years ago. And he wasn't asked about it. This wasn't, a, this wasn't a reporter's question. He brought it up of his own volition, something that Xavi had said six years ago about the style of Atletico Madrid under Simeone not being suitable for the top clubs. And it still... Ticks him off now. Yeah, it's just still annoying him after all these years, old gripes. So uh, he brought it up. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't do Atletico Madrid any good. They went ahead, but Barcelona quickly equalised with a ridiculous uh, sort of outside of the foot volley from Jordi Alba. Oh, which, yeah. Alves to Alba. Yes. Winding uh, back the that, clock. Winding back the years. And then Danny Alves ended up getting on the score sheet himself, his first goal and since returning to off. Barcelona. He did get sent off. Uh, late in the second half with uh, unnecessary uh, studs on the on the calf of one of the Atletico attackers, but didn't matter. Barcelona win 4-2 after that, that goal-scoring spree in the first half. And Adama Traore made quite the impression uh, on... Uh, El Chiringuito. Yes, well, he, he uh, created the goal for Gavi with an old-fashioned bit of wing play, bustling down the right-hand side and hanging the ball up. And for once, the ball actually went where it was supposed to and not out of play. And, uh, yeah, El Chiringuito were divided in their opinions yeah. on on the new man at Barcelona. Uh, one panellist saying that he was all muscle and no skill, uh, no subtlety about him whatsoever. But uh, he certainly did the business for Barcelona this morning and uh, both coaches are desperate to squeeze into fourth place and make the Champions League. So that was a pretty important result for La Liga standings. And also it saw the debut of Aubameyang off the bench for Barcelona. He had some choice words during the week about Mikel Arteta's reign at the club. Uh, since leaving, he just came in off the 10-foot run-up uh, a la Teo Palazzari on TNC last <laughs> night. Um, but I'll tell you what, big three points for Barcelona. It keeps It's been one hell of a turnaround. I've got to say, Xavi's done a brilliant job. And if he can get them at least to the Champions League after the start of the season they had, it's a more than a commendable job. Um, you know, the title race there is still alive. Mm. You know, I'm not I'm not saying it's done yet, but Sevilla haven't won in their last three. They've drawn their last three games. So it's like their own they're their own worst enemy right now because Real Madrid keep giving them like a, a bit of rope and say, Hey, like come on, let's 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 have a bit of fun here. Let's make this interesting. But Sevilla just don't want it. They don't want a bar of it. So they've dropped their last three games. Uh Madrid is six points clear. They Drew against Osasuna, Sevilla, that is a goalless draw as well. So that's a big two points shot. While Real Madrid came away with a 1 0 win against Granada. Did Marco you see Asensio. the goal? No, I actually haven't seen the goal. It reminded me so much of like peak Ronaldo at Real Madrid. Just the aesthetics of it. Oh, yeah. Almost no backlift. 
amazing strike, ball yeah. totally still and swerving and dipping into the corner from outside the box, obviously in his left foot as opposed to usually it was Ronaldo's yeah. right. Um, but he whips the shirt off straight away. You know, Bernabeu goes crazy. Yeah. He reveals the eight pack, you know, yeah. and just the sheer physicality of it and just the style of player that Asensio is. I think injuries have gone the way and he hasn't always had, uh, you know, Zidane's faith and, and Ancelotti has used him sparingly. Uh, but I just still think he's a hell of a player. Absolutely. And Real, Real Madrid, they they basically battered Granada for yeah. 75 minutes. And finally. And finally made the breakthrough. But it was always going to be Asensio in yeah. that game. He was just having so many shots. He was just peppering the goalkeeper. And the uh, goalkeeper from uh, Granada, uh, Maximiano, was just making save after save after save. Uh, it was really incredible performance from the goalkeeper. But eventually the pressure told and uh, a spectacular finish uh, to to extend Real Madrid's lead at the top of the La Liga's table with uh, six point advantage over Sevilla. Now I think the title is pretty much done. To be honest, yeah, I think if it extends beyond six, I think we can firmly mm. say that it's heading to Real Madrid at the end of the season. Um, but just uh, it's good to see Asensio actually playing and playing well because, as you did mention, he has a bucket loads of talent, and you want He's to see got a him hell do of a well. left foot. Like Absolutely. a player who can strike the ball that cleanly yeah. that often and just shifted onto his left foot so quickly mm. is so, so dangerous. That's what Madrid thought they were getting in Gareth Bale. Yeah, and, and we saw how that turned out. Yeah, so Asensio, I'm a, I'm a big fan of him. You know, he's not a subtle player at all. He just yeah. sort of just loves to shoot and shoot often. Uh, but it's great to watch the way he strikes the ball and it just flies off his foot. So. It's like he's on a permanent football manager setting of shoot on sight, you know, <laughs> Pretty much. basically. So about Gareth Bale, just as you mentioned, I totally forgot about Gareth Bale being back at Real Madrid after <laughs> being at Still there. He's just playing golf. I think that's all he's doing, just lapping up the Madrid Actually, he got in courses. trouble the other day. I don't oh, know if really? you saw this. Uh, I guess it was picked up by... Probably. Oh, was that him laughing? He was laughing at Aiden Hazard. So Aiden Hazard was warming up <laughs> for ages. He was called up yeah. and then told to go sit back down again. And, and Bale Gareth Bale just started cacking himself <laughs> and he got in a little bit of trouble after the game uh, you know, have a bit of fun yeah but have a bit of fun. you know it's sort of the same plight that bale's been stuck in like yeah. he's never going to play he's just um on too high wages to shift so he's just an ornament there and the same thing has happened to hazard i mean it's it's kind of crazy um you know he's been totally displaced out of the first team mm. uh he arrived with so much fanfare i remember real madrid announced him in the middle of the women's world cup final that's right uh, yeah. which drew some ire from uh, from some fans from who Woso's Twitter. Bit, bit uh a bit disrespectful yeah um but he hasn't lived up to the hype whatsoever and uh real madrid currently have two incredibly expensive paperweights on their bench at the moment yep uh, just before we wrap up, Josh, uh, some of the big games keep an eye on for those at home. You want to keep an eye on catching some culture or just some football in general over the weekend. Talking about Serie A, two massive games this weekend coming up. These are also seismic when it comes to the title race. Sunday, 4 a.m., Again, a terrible time slot for the best game of the weekend. Napoli hosts Inter. This is going to be an absolute cracking game between the top two sides in the league. We know Inter have that one-point gap on both Napoli and Milan, so this will be an intriguing watch to see how that one goes. Napoli back in some form, so keep an eye on that one. Atalanta hosts Juventus the following morning at 645 just some real, real tasty games in Serie A this weekend. If you're keeping your eye on a bit of German football, you want to hope that that title race stays alive. Buy and take on Bochum while Dortmund travel to Berlin to take on Union Berlin. And if you're on... Union. Aiden, Union. Union Berlin. And uh, our good friend Aiden Trustich is in action against Wolfsburg on the weekend. I sound a lot like Athos Syrianos in saying our good friend. <laughs> um, in La Liga this weekend as well. In La Liga. Uh, we've got Barcelona taking on Espanyol. Oh, the, it, it's a derby. It is. It's a, a derby, yeah. Oh, well, the Catalan, someone, it's one of those. It is the Catalan derby. derby. But as uh, my my Kule uh, friend, my Barcelona season ticket holding friend, Mark likes to say, Espanyol are not a team from Barcelona. There they you are, go. They're an embarrassment. So <laughs> they don't acknowledge them. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah. I get what you mean. Uh, Atleti take on Getafe. Villarreal versus Real Madrid. Massive game. Obviously, Villarreal can get some points in that one. It could give Sevilla... A bit of hope, just a little bit of hope mm. in that one. And obviously the Premier League will be back in action. Nick Hughes will be all over that on Wednesday night. So keep an eye on that one. Tomorrow night, the Oz Football Hour, Chris McLaughlin from yes. the BBC joining you guys. Yes, we cannot wait to talk some fit bar uh, with our Scottish correspondent, Chris McLaughlin from the BBC. He's going to be joining us from 645 uh, PM Australian Eastern Time. 
uh, yeah, that's going to be great. He's just great value. Uh, he knows everything there is to know about the Scottish top flight. So we're going to ask him about the Aussies, uh, how they're doing over at Heart of Midlothian, about Ange and Tom Rogic, of course, and uh, his review of the old firm derby. And we might even get into, I guess, the controversy uh, that has engulfed uh, a team in the in the second division in Scotland with one of their signings that has uh, drawn a yes. lot of ire from the community and even uh, led to their women's team and one of their major sponsors actually ditching the club. They've since backpedalled on that, so I uh, might get some reflections from him on uh, on the David Goodwillie controversy. That is quite an interesting situation evolving there. To be honest, I'd totally forgotten about David uh, Goodwillie and, before uh, that Rafe name came up. And the yeah. club, so. Yep, so uh, make sure you tune in for that one from 6pm tomorrow. A lot of Oz football to touch on. Massive weekend in A-League men's. And we've got a rescheduling as well. So so Radio Dub with myself and Pakua Frimpong is going to be on Wednesday. So that yep. one's 6 p.m., followed by The Green Room at 7 and uh, the EPL show at 8. So a triple bill on Wednesday, just the Oz Football Hour tomorrow from the 6. The FNR Wednesday trifecta. Look forward to it, obviously, Thursday. State of our football nation is back. But, Josh... It's time for us to say goodbye. If you've missed any of it, you've tuned in late, make sure you head over to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get them. Tune in. Give us a review, subscribe, let us know your thoughts, drop us some questions. We'll be back again from 6pm next Monday. Plenty to look forward to in the world of European football. So for myself, Nick Tabano and Josh Parrish, it's goodbye for now. Sometimes I feel... I don't know. I don't know. Buona giornata. Buona serata. Buona giornata. There's not really time to relax and take an espresso for Juventus. <laughs> You don't have to get a bad attitude. You don't have to get a bad attitude. Attaccare!